Lofti Soundshot. Insights and analysis from one of the leading law firms in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wolf Tie Soundshot, the podcast which brings you the latest on legal developments in Central and Eastern Europe. Today's topic is renewable energy, with a particular focus on Romania. However, many of the topics discussed will be relevant for stakeholders in renewables across the region. Our speakers are Brian Jardine and James Coulter Eady. Brian is the managing partner of the Wolf Tice office in Romania and has extensive experience in renewables. James is the founder and CEO of Jade Power Trust and also shares his expert knowledge of the renewables market in Romania in today's podcast. Enjoy the discussion. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Wolf Tice podcast. My name is Brian Chardine. I'm the managing partner of the Wolf Tice office in Bucharest, and I'm honored to be joined here today by Mr. James Coulter Eady. Besides being a client, Coulter is a, a very well-known businessman who's worked in Romania for a number of years, and we wanted to talk about what's happening in the renewable energy sector in Romania, and we thought it would be really worthwhile to have the views of Coulter. Coulter, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience here. Great. Thanks a lot, Brian, and uh, thanks a lot for having me uh, today on this podcast and giving me the opportunity to share my views and experiences in Romania, as well as in the renewable energy sector since 2013, when we first entered uh, the country. I was the founder, I, I am the founder and CEO of what was in its final iteration known as Jade Power Trust, and we were a publicly listed renewable energy IPP uh, listed on the TSXV exchange in Canada, but with a focus on acquiring and consolidating renewable energy assets in Romania and the greater Eastern European market through 2013 until the subsequent sale of the portfolio in 2022. And, and Coulter, why Romania? I mean, what motivated you? Obviously, this was a time we know historically, when you mentioned 2013, 2014, when Romania had a fairly attractive tradable green certificate regime. But of course, we know that subsequent to 2016, that was suspended due to overcompensation or alleged overcompensation of the sector. And I'm just curious, uh, how much of a driver was that sub initial subsidy scheme? And uh, if the suspension of that, uh, that scheme made you question or uh, raise concerns for you and your investors as to why or whether the choice of Romania in retrospect had been the right market to enter? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question. And uh, you would always like to know if you've entered uh, in the bottom of the market or not. We took the view, and, and, I, and I don't know if we, we hit the timing perfectly, but I think the closing of our transaction in 2022 was definitely a success uh, when you look at our average per megawatt cost basis through our various acquisitions over the years uh, to what our ultimate sale price is. But uh, yeah, we found Romania an interesting market at the time because it was really a market of developers and because the market had started to cool in you know 2014, 2015, developers wanted to recycle their capital and move on to, to other markets. We, we really took the view that, you know, being on the periphery of the EU, there was a bastion of value in their Romanian market. And there was an opportunity for a consolidator to come in and to acquire these operational projects that were, were still held by local developers that couldn't access capital. So that, that was really the view that we took. Now, if we time the bottom of the market properly or not, I think that's another story. Uh, we certainly had our challenges over the years with the problems with the green certificates, uh, you know, the linking between the green certificates and the energy pricing, et cetera. But I think we were nimble enough and we had a hands-on management approach that ultimately uh, we were able to realize a success for our investors in the portfolio. And it's interesting when you look at the portfolio, you seem to be a sort of technology agnostic in the sense that you weren't just focused like most investors in wind or in solar. In fact, you had a mix, as I understand. You had two wind projects, two solar projects, and two hydro projects 
uh, among the portfolio of projects that you ultimately consolidated and exited. Did you find uh, in your experience that any one of those three was seemed to be an easier technology to manage, either from a technical or a commercial point of view, or 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 did did it really not matter? You just essentially looked at the megawatts produced and you had your offtake agreements. So whether that came from hydro, wind, or solar, it, it really didn't matter because it was all eligible for the green certificates uh, and, and eligible to be considered renewable for purposes of the offtake. Well, that's a great question, Brian. I think ultimately it was a strategic investment decision. The initial thesis for the fund was that we would diversify across geographies as well as across technologies. And, you know, generally speaking, there is synergies between when wind blows, when the sun's up, when there's water. And so by having a diversified portfolio, we really sought to mitigate some of the risk if some of those resources, one or two of those resources, you know, was at a lower point within its resource cycle. Uh, you know, we, we inevitably could make up with the solar if the wind is low or vice versa. So I think ultimately it was a strategic uh, initial uh, thesis that we should be across all asset sectors. Ultimately, each asset sector had its own challenges from a management and operational perspective, but really, I would say we were successful across all of the sectors with managing the different technologies. And, and then ultimately, the other part of our investment thesis, which unfortunately, you know, we were just positioning ourselves to, to move into different markets, was to diversify across geography, especially when you're looking at the 2012 to 2016 kind of time frame, a lot of the renewable uh, business was under pegged by a subsidy regime across the board. And so really, we also felt need to diversify across geographies. R really, these, these things inevitably take longer to roll out than you always think. And, you know, we were just positioning ourselves before the sale in 2022 to to roll out into into different geographies but that was really the the investment thesis for the portfolio and I think it's interesting that, you know, given the timing of when you, you know, these projects were acquired and when they were operational, you actually were sort of grandfathered in with these green certificates. Um, how much of a sort of incentive do you think this was for the buyer upon your exit? In other words, was your project unique in the sense that it was a fairly, let's, I don't say old, but, a, but an established uh, series of projects that were availing themselves of the green certificates. So that was sort of some uh, extra revenue stream that could be calculated in for, for the benefit of the buyer was, do you think that was one of the drivers or do you think that was just sort of incidental and that that portfolio would have been attractive regardless of whether it had, had the added green certificate benefit? Yeah, I think the green certificates were, I mean, it's a market-based mechanism versus some of the other subsidy structures from a feed-in tariff perspective where it's really a state budget mechanism. Uh, so it's really something that's supported by the market and the consumer on the green certificate side. And obviously, you know, at this time when they were rolling out these different programs and analyzing them, the assets really needed the technology from a per megawatt basis, from an investment perspective, it needed the support from these different subsidy schemes. Uh, you know, we did purchase our assets through, you know, on an average weighted basis, but we also did substantially uh, pay from a per megawatt basis for some of our earliest acquisitions. And we did ha also have project financing and leases, which we had to service. So the green certificates were integral part of our cash flow stream and the revenue to our projects. And, you know, that I would say the main focus from management's time was, you know, hands-on management of those contracts. Romania is such a dynamic energy market as it is versus an asset which would be commissioned, say, in Western Europe in 2008, 2009, 2010 with a long-term feed and tariff scheme where it was really whatever energy you generated, you delivered to the grid, you know, you collected your check every month from that asset. Much different market in Romania, very free market oriented, merchant basis, highly competitive market dynamics and sentiment mean that short term PPAs are the norm, fairly hard to find a PPA over three, five years in the market. And having said that, I mean, on, for instance, on our solar assets, 
Our revenue split was roughly 15, 20% on energy, the balance based on green certificate revenue. You know, we had substantial uh, project financing on those solar assets. So we were always actively managing our green certificates. I think the value which we had for our ultimate exit in 2022 for the buyer was that we had structured a portfolio of corporate PPAs that really gave a credit perspective, which was very, I think, difficult to get in Romania on your PPA basket from your portfolio. Well, roughly uh, half of our offtake, both on the energy and green certificate side, was secured under long-term offtake agreement uh, with a credit rating. And then the balance of the portfolio was was in a more of a merchant basis, but we were always successful in selling 100% of our green certificates. And I think ultimately by being able to demonstrate that that contract structure had a history and was always able to perform, I think that was a big driver of value for the ultimate exit in 2022. And, and in terms of the timing of the exit, that was actually leading into my next question. Had you strategically decided back in 2013, 14, when you were consolidating these assets that you would be looking at like an eight, nine year exit, or was it opportunistic? Did the, did the right buyer come at the right time or, or were you know, intending to run a process? Or could you describe a bit more about the strategic decision? Why exit in 2022? Why not continue to own and operate these assets for another two, three, five years? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. And, you know, these investment decisions are driven by many factors. I believe the investor sentiment for the, well, first of all, the fund was an open-ended listed fund. So we we weren't a close-end fund. We had no term obligations to sell down, et cetera. I believe there was, a, you know, management's view would have been to grow the portfolio into different jurisdictions. Uh, we had uh, struggled a lot through managing the portfolio, in all honesty, in Romania over the years through the tough years with the subsidy cut from 2016 through 2018. Uh, there, that was really hands-on active management through management. But also that was the great tremendous opportunity for us. Uh, our last acquisition in 2018, we were looking at a purchase price of roughly 450,000 euros per megawatt. And ultimately our exit price in 2020 was almost double that with substantial dividends paid back to the top parent company through that period of time. And so I think shareholders uh, and management sentiment at the time was that you know, opportunistically, this is a very top height, the, it's the height of the market as, as we see it in Romania at the time. And we, we just decided to take profits for shareholders ultimately and wind down the fund. And well, that's what we did in 2022. Well, for the benefit of our listeners who may think, wow, this sounds great, easy money to be made. I think it's fair to say that it was a very challenging transaction, you know, and I think it, it would be informative to understand a bit. I mean, obviously, we had the honor of advising Wolf Tice advising you on this transaction. So we're aware of some of the challenges, but perhaps for the benefit of the listeners, you could touch on what were some of the um, challenges you've, you faced in, in moving forward with the actual exit once the bidder was identified, once you were in uh, negotiations in terms of perhaps considering structure and what were some of the other, you know, some of the other elements of the sale, which you think were necessary from a commercial perspective to give comfort to the buyer and to get this over the finish line, so to speak. I'm thinking, for example, having insurance in place, which I know we talked about early on, but some of the other sort of adaptations or structuring concessions or structuring elements that were at play in order to make sure that this um, this transaction was successfully uh, signed and then ultimately closed, because it took the better part of a year to, for the, our listeners should be aware this was not something that happened overnight. Exactly. And, you know, none of the value created on the portfolio happened overnight. You know, uh, I was talking about entering at the bottom of the market, you know, always wanted to time that right, especially from a consolidator's perspective. And I mean, we were definitely a little bit early in the market. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely felt that pain with the final adjustments to the legislation in 2016. And, and really took an active hands-on management approach to the portfolio just to be able to steer it through 
to the ultimate value creation, which uh, which was realized from the portfolio. So I, I completely agree with you, Brian. It was not uh, it was not easy money, and you know we we really we moved our center of our management group to to Romania to Bucharest. I, I think that was really part of our success because it's really a market and a jurisdiction where you can't sit back and relax and, and just collect your checks. I mean, you, you've got to be on top of the assets and the, on top of managing your cash flows on a constant basis. Uh, the structure was quite complex. We were a publicly listed trust uh, listed on the Toronto Stock Ex- Venture Exchange. And we had a BV and co-op holding structure, which was owned 100% by the listed trust. And And then that structure owned various Romanian holding companies, which then had ownership then in the Romanian SPVs, uh, which were various uh, operating and licensed power plants of wind, solar, and hydro. So it was quite complex structure, even though we we were not a big fund by any means, or we weren't a big fund by any means. Uh, one of our successes was having a very professional structure in place and a platform to be able to do transactions and to raise capital uh, and b- bring that bridge between Western capital markets and the opportunities which we saw in, in emerging Romania or Eastern Europe at the time. And so that was, you know, it was important that we set up that structure, but th- that structure was by no means a cheap structure to maintain. And then on top of it, to do the transaction, uh, we're, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, over six companies that were involved in the transaction with three jurisdictions. The ultimate buyer changed the structure several times in terms of the level to purchase and ultimately settled on not purchasing the, the BV and co-op level, but purchasing at the Romanian level. And so... It was, a, it was a quite a complex structure. And, and the other point which you brought up, Brian, which is a good point, is that you know, we were able to mitigate some of the risk uh, through the rep and warranty insurance, which was also a condition of the transaction for the buyer. And that was also put in place prior to or, or contemporaneously with the closing of the transaction, which really gave assurance to the buyer with respect to the reps and warranties on the various companies. So you're right, it was quite a complex transaction. It it was not conditional on financing, but it still took almost a year to close the transaction from the time that we signed the initial non-binding expression of interest to the ultimate closing of the transaction. I was was just shy of uh, 12 months. While we're entering into the last sort of five minutes or so of the of the conversation here, I just, you know, it's been very fascinating for me, but I think what's encouraging is maybe you could talk about and inform our listeners as to what are your plans going ahead? Because I think it's uh, really encouraging that you haven't just simply take the money and run. You mentioned that you've lived here. I mean, you've you've had to oversee the operations leading up to the exit, but your, your intention, as I understand, is to still remain in uh, Romania for the foreseeable future with your family because you've got some other interesting things things on the horizon. Perhaps you could, without disclosing anything, obviously, that's confidential or that's business secret, but maybe you could let us know what you're thinking about in terms of where Colt or Edie will be in the next two, three, five years in terms of the business. Yeah, great. Well, this will be a good billboard for anyone that wants a hired gun in Romania, because I'm (laughs) always... I'm always looking for new opportunities and, uh, you know, the last eight years I built up, as I believe and think ultimately proven out through the transaction, an understanding of, you know, how to operate in, in not just Romania, but a merchant energy market. I think there's a lot of good lessons that can be learned from Romania. It's a highly competitive market. It's highly dynamic. And, you know, if you can make it in Romania, I think you can make it anywhere. That's that's basically what I say. So I, I think, look, out of, you know, where I see opportunity and value is really looking at what the challenges were for the portfolio and for management's time in the portfolio. And I think it's, it speaks to the broader questions of renewable integration that's happening everywhere. It's not just Romania. Romania started a bit earlier because of the green certificate structure and because of the nature of the market. But really, you know, renewable integration and being able to unlock the value with renewable integration, I think, is the key 
driver of value in the renewable business. You know, the, the large IPPs are, it's a, a capital deployment exercise for them and it's a cost of capital exercise. But I think if you really understand a market and the integration, and now, especially with the issues that we're having in Ukraine with the kind of the jump over gas for the energy transition, it's really about how can we integrate renewables. And so we're working on some very interesting and unique opportunities where we're looking to pair renewable development or renewable assets with long duration energy storage and ultimately be able to replace the same use case as gas. And you know this, I think, is something that's very, very interesting, and uh, and this is really what we've been working on. So, you know, we're we're in the process of sounding the market here in Romania for for our next opportunities, as well as looking into into other jurisdictions globally. So, I hope in a year or two to be doing a, another podcast with you on uh, the next opportunity, Brian. Well, uh, Coulter, thank you very much. We'll definitely look forward to that. And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule uh, to chat with us here today. And yeah, for our listeners, we hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation today. It's been a pleasure for me, again, Brian Jardine, to invite Coulter Eady to share his thoughts and his views on, on the Romanian renewables market and the renewables market in general. And we look forward to our next podcast. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Wolftai Soundshot. For more information, you can contact us via email at soundshot at wolftice.com or visit our website at www.wolftice.com. You can also follow us here to receive further updates on developments in law and business from one of the leading law firms in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe.